Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. We talk about Blu-rays here. And today I'm talking about a variety of Kino releases. Um, one big one that's on 4K. And then several reissues that I will go through. Some good films in that bunch. Uh, but let's start with the big one here. And that is Fear and Desire. Stanley Kubrick's film. Uh, this was from, I believe, 1953, black and white film, his debut, and a movie that I never really bothered to see because, well, I didn't, I didn't make a great effort to see it, let's put it like that, uh, because Kubrick himself has always been so down on it, so I was always kind of like, well, if he's not into it, there must be, he must be onto something, you know? And, um, so I just sort of at some point decided I wasn't going to seek it out. On top of which, here's the thing, it wasn't that easy to see for a really long time. And so those two things combined just sort of pushed my interest down. You know, he was clearly not happy with it, or at least he didn't feel like it represented, you know, him as a filmmaker, or it wasn't a, a debut that he was happy with. Um, so what's interesting about this Blu-ray is that, of course, it is a 4K and it is a brand new HDR Dolby Vision Master of two cuts of the film. And we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, 4K restoration from the 35 millimeter camera negative and fine grain. So this looks fantastic. It looks really nice, uh, in the black and white 4K. Now, in terms of the cut itself... All right, well, let's back up a second. So it's Fear and Desire. What is Fear and Desire? It's sort of his ambitious first feature. Um, it's touching on themes of war that he would later jump w into with both feet uh, with films like Paths of Glory and Full Metal Jacket and, you know, even Dr. Strangelove. You know, that war would become a big, big deal to him. And so this is sort of an existential drama, which, you know, has the feeling of a waking dream rather than a conventional war film. And it's about four soldiers who return to their senses after a crash landing in a forest behind enemy lines, basically. And they're sort of blindly navigating their way back to their unit. You know, they have found a way to get back across the lines. It requires them to make a raft uh, they end up sort of attacking an isolated cabin occupied by enemy soldiers. They apprehend a peasant woman. Um, and uh, this movie stars a very young uh, Paul Mazursky in his first film. Obviously, he would go on to act, but more notably direct uh, a lot of films. He'd go on to Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice and a big hit in 1969 and um, many films after that. Um, Harry and Tonto, I'm a big fan of. Um, Alex in Wonderland, his own take on, you know, eight and a half. Uh, so a great filmmaker, but boy, is he young in this movie. And he is the soldier that is left to uh, keep an eye on the peasant woman that they um, end up taking hostage, sort of, because they're afraid she's going to she's gonna tell on them to the uh, evil soldiers. Um, but what's... What's really interesting about it is that it opens like almost like a Twilight Zone because it opens with this omniscient voiceover that basically sets up who these soldiers are, but it also says this war and these soldiers exist outside of reality. And so it feels like, you know, five characters in search of an exit or something, you know, like that sort of Twilight Zone thing. And, you know, there is some speculation maybe uh, Rod Serling saw this. Um, but anyway, it's one lieutenant officer and three grunts. And yeah, so the, I guess, Kubrick um, was really stung by the negative audience and critical reaction to the film and immediately decided to tone down the philosophical aspects of the film. So this is where we get into the two cuts. Uh, originally, it's a 70-minute film, just barely feature length. 
Uh, but it does have a lot of that voiceover and that I'm sure the setup uh, that sort of established it as, you know, some otherworldly thing. Um, but he cuts it down to 62 minutes and cuts out the metaphysical experience and makes it more of a conventional war film, basically. And so you have a 62 minute version that was the one that was released soon after that backlash basically until the library of congress came into possession of a 35 millimeter uh element of the original 70 minute premiere cut which has not been seen since its interrupted theatrical run in 1953 so that's the significance of this release is that you're getting the original premiere cut and that's another reason i'm glad i waited because i'm sure i would have just seen the 62 minute conventional war film version now is it a stunning work of genius. I think we can probably agree it's not, but you know, he's trying, he's definitely trying, um, swing and a miss, if you will. It doesn't amount to much for me, uh, but it is beautifully photographed. He did, uh, shoot it, produce it and edit it himself. It's written by a guy named Howard Sackler, who was, I guess, sort of a, a poet writer at the time. He would go on to write, uh, do an uncredited write of Killer's Kiss, and he'd work on other scripts in the 70s, Jaws 2, Grey Lady Down, St. Jack. But so yeah, Kubrick produces and directs and edits. Um, but like the neo-realist that I think he admired at the time, he shot without sound. Uh, the Mitchell, Mitchell and I think IMO cameras, IMO cameras that he used couldn't shoot sync sound anyway. Uh, so he ended up having to post-dub the entire film. And that ended up costing him more than twice what he paid to shoot the film in the first place, driving the budget up to around $40,000. So I think there's a lot of reasons Kubrick is a little down on this film. Um, okay, so, you know, beautiful presentation. I watched the film. I'm glad to have finally seen it. Uh, this includes two commentaries, one from film historian Eddie Von Mueller and the 70-minute cut, which I was listening to and very much enjoying. I got some of the tidbits out of that. And then there's an audio commentary from historian screenwriter Gary Gerani on the 62-minute cut. Uh, on top of that, we have three Kubrick shorts. Um, we have one called the called Flying Padre from 1951. That's nine minutes long. And it's sort of two days in the life of uh, priest father Fred Statmuller, whose New Mexico parish is so large he can only spread goodness and light among his flock with the aid of a monoplane. Uh, the priestly pilot is seen dashing from one province to the next at the helm of his trusty Piper Cub, administering guidance, his plane, the Flying Padre, to unruly children, sermonizing at fu funerals, and flying a sickly child and his mother to a hospital. So that's nine minutes. Uh, again, early Kubrick, you can see what he's getting started doing. Uh, there's one called Day of the Fight, which is a 16-minute short, and it's... Uh, it says, after a short study of, a, of boxing's history narrated by newscaster Douglas Edwards, we follow a day in the life of a middleweight Irish boxer named Walter Cartier. So that's what that is. It's sort of a docu film. Uh, and then when he did in 1953 called The Seafarers, that's 29 minutes. I'm not sure if that's pre or post Fear and Desire, but it's his first film made in color, lost for over 40, me 40 years. And it's a documentary that extols the benefits of membership in the Seafarers International Union. So you get a lot of stuff on this. It's, you know, about what Criterion would probably have if they put this out themselves. Again, it's a 4K and a Blu-ray. You get both in this set and it looks great. And, you know, Kubrick completists are going to want this and they're going to want to see it. But I'm glad to have finally seen it in its best format possible. That, that was quite nice, I must say. Um, okay, moving on. I got a bunch of... Um, reissues here and some really solid films we'll start with probably my favorite in the bunch and that is the long riders this is walter hill's 1980 western which is truly a great western on top of what i'm going to talk about but really really great western it is um a brand new 4k restoration apparently uh on the back, it says 2017 4K restoration. So I think it might be the same scan as the previous, but don't quote me on that. Um, from the great Walter Hill, of course. 
Um, and it's Jesse James and his, ga- and his gang of outlaws ride again this extraordinary western that pulsates with hard driving action and electrifying drama. Four sets of actor brothers. This is what's really neat about this movie. No other film pulled this particular feat off. You have David Carradine, Keith Carradine, and Robert Carradine. Um, and they play the Youngers. They play Cole, Jim, and Bob Younger. Then you have the Keach brothers. James and Stacy Keach play uh, Jesse James and Frank James. Then you have Randy Quaid and Dennis Quaid playing Miller brothers, Ed Miller and Clell Miller. And then on top of that, you have uh, Christopher Guest and his brother Bob, uh, Nicholas Guest playing the Fords, Charlie Ford and Bob Ford. So you have real life, four real life sets of brothers, um, each depicting real life siblings in this emotionally charged portrayal of the Old West legendary bandits. The notorious James Younger gang is one of the most famous groups of outlaws in the country, robbing banks, trains, and stagecoaches with a sense of daring that makes them folk heroes throughout the land. But the mighty Pinkerton detective agency swears to track them down. These criminals must face an awesome enemy that will stop at nothing to see them behind bars or dead. Only uh, through their strength uh, of their loyalty and blood ties can the outlaws hope to survive brutal pursuits unexpected betrayals and blistering showdowns that mark the end of their dangerous ride. This is part of a run of great films that Walter Hill was making in the late seventies and early eighties. I mean, you have this one's followed almost immediately by Southern comfort, which is right near the top of my favorites of his films. It is preceded by the warriors in 1979 and the driver in 1978. Uh, Hard Times, 1975, and then he'd go on to do Streets of Fire. I mean, he just was on this incredible roll, and this is just a really great Western. This cast is ridiculous, you know? I mean, it is truly something special, and, uh, you know, there's James Remar, Harry Carey Jr., Pamela Reed. There's a lot of folks here that really um, make up an incredible cast. Now, this is a two-disc set. And it has a slipcase now. I, this is where I think it's mostly like the previous release. Uh, 2017 4K restoration. Audio commentary by film historians Howard S. Berger, Steve Mitchell, and Nathaniel Thompson. Interview with stars Keith and Robert Carradine. Interview with stars Stacy and James Keach. Interview with star Randy Quaid. Interview with actor Nicholas Guest. Interview with director Walter Hill himself. Interview with composer Ry Cooter, a regular collaborator and guitar maestro that really gave a little extra something to uh, the Hill films. Uh, interview with producer Tim Zinneman, Outlaw Brothers, The Making of the Long Rider, 61 Minutes, so an hour-long doc on that. Northfield, Minnesota Raid, Anatomy of a Scene, 15 Minutes. Slow Motion, Walter Hill on Sam Peckinpah, 6 Minutes. Um, so it's a really sweet set and a great Western that I highly recommend. Uh, moving on to another Western. This one now, again, has a slipcase. It didn't before. This is Death Rides a Horse. This is a Quentin Tarantino favorite, directed by Julie, Giulio Petroni, uh, starring Lee Van Cleef, John Philip Law, Mario Brega, Luigi, Luigi Pastilli, Anthony Dawson, and others um, from 1967. And it's a bona fide spaghetti Western classic, 15 years after Four Bandits massacred his, his family while executing a $200,000 robbery, a young man, John Philip Law, uh, who is in danger of diabolic and others, seeks revenge. The man responsible for the murders all hold positions of power in the New West, but now a bandit, Lee Van Cleef, uh, they had framed for the murders, is due to be released from prison. He's uh, ready to exact bloody reprisals and decides to form an unholy alliance with the vengeance-seeking young man. This stylish tale, Lee... Uh, directed by G- G- Giulio Petroni and written by Luciano Vincenzoni, uh, who also wrote The Mercenary, featured a strong supporting cast, Mario Brega, Luigi Pastilli, Anthony Dawson, and with a haunting, rousing score by, of course, the legendary maestro himself, Ennio Morricone. And this one includes a commentary from filmmaker Alex Cox of Repo Man fame. He is a spaghetti western crazed man he of course made one himself straight to hell which came out from kino years back a very interesting revisionist spaghetti western of sorts uh or western straight up um 
but this is a nice disc and a movie that I've been meaning to see for a long time, so I will be checking that out. Uh, not quite a Western, but close, and, and directed by a man who t- ties directly into Ennio Marconi, and that, of course, would be uh, Mr. Sergio Leone. And that is a film called A Fistful of Dynamite, a.k.a. Duck You Sucker. And again, this is a reissue, uh, so I don't think anything in terms of the transfer is new. I would love to have gotten a 4K of this one, um, but, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Nice to have it with a slipcase, and it's still a really, really nice special edition with lots of features. Uh, This is a lesser seen film. This one is from 1971, so it's after the Dollars Trilogy, and, but, you know, before Once Upon a Time, it's after Once Upon a Time in the West, actually, even, too, but before um, Once Upon a Time in America. Uh, from Sergio Leone, the claimed director of Fistful of Dollars for a few dollars more, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and Once Upon a Time in the West, comes his final Western, a relentlessly entertaining film that teams an Irish explosive specialist with a Mexican peasant-turned-revolutionary leader, um, starring Rod St- acting giants Rod Steiger, uh, as Juan Miranda, the cigar-jumping, salt-of-the-earth peasant with a Robin Hood heart, and James Coburn as John Mallory, a dynamite-tossing Irish revolutionary. It's fun to hear him talking with an accent, this whole movie. Um, who has fled Mexico to practice his skills. Together, they, their devilishly volatile mix of anti-establishment phil- philosophies and violent tendencies, they attempt to liberate political prisoners, defend their compatriots uh, against a well-equipped equip militia and risk their lives on a train filled with explosives haunting and rousing score of course by Ennio Morricone um this also has an audio commentary by filmmaker Alex Cox which I am very excited to listen to I I've had this disc before and I did not even realize it had that track so audio commentary by film historian Sir Christopher Frayling as well featurette the myth of revolution uh, featurette Sergio Donati Remembers, featurette Once Upon a Time in Italy, the Autry ex- Exhibition, featurette Sorting Out the Versions, featurette Restoration Italian Style and Location Comparisons, as well as a trailer from Hell from Brian Trenchard Smith. Um, very cool to have this in a nice slipcase edition now. Uh, 157 minutes, so definitely an epic to match uh, the epic filmmaking that Leone had done previous to this. Now, jumping from the James Coburn side of that, we go into a very interesting uh, comedy directed by a guy named Theodore J. Flicker. And this film is called The President's Analyst from 1967. During what is really effectively James Coburn's heyday. Uh, A really great supporting cast here. Godfrey Cambridge, Severn Darden, Joan Delaney, um, Will Gear. Bill Daniels, you know, it's it's a really interesting cult movie. Now, this is coming out on Blu-ray for the second time, technically, because imprint, imprint Films put this out. However, this is a brand new HD master from Paramount Pictures from a 4K scan of the 35 original camera negative. So um, you can toss that other one. This is, this is the one you're going to want. It's um, writer-director Theodore, Theodore J. Flicker's psychedelic satire, And it's one of the wackiest, wittiest cult classics of the 60s with the responsibilities of world peace, the national debt, and uh, desert choices at state state dinners, dessert choices at state dinners. Constantly on his mind, it seems like a good idea to find the president of the United States, an analyst to help him deal with his burdens. Dr. Sidney Schaefer, the great James Coburn, this is when he was doing Our Man Flint, the Flint series and stuff, uh, wins the coveted job not without a price. Uh, governments from all over the globe are soon targeting the hapless doctor. They want to get uh, access to the president's secrets, if you will. Uh, some want him to spill whatever secrets may have been discussed in the Oval Office, while others want to silence him permanently to prevent him from possibly revealing that very information. And there's this whole conspiracy with the phone company, which <laughs> is going to seem a little silly now because there's so many different phone uh options but at at the time the phone company was much more of a singular um you know uh, bureaucratic thing but they really make it into something ridiculous in this movie and that's pretty fun um but yeah so godfrey cambridge severin darden joan delaney 
Uh, so yeah, brand new scan, as I said, new audio commentary from film historian writer Julie Kirgo and writer filmmaker Peter Hankoff. I adore Julie Kirgo. Uh, I always loved her work with um, Twilight Time, and so very excited to hear that new track. And this includes the other commentary track with novelist and critic Tim Lucas. Uh, fantastic. So a couple commentaries and a new scan for a 60s cult classic that I think is pretty enjoyable and very weird and fun. Just a couple more things here. We will talk about Mario Bava and his film The Whip and the Body. Maybe one of the kinkier films he made. This is from 1963. Stars Christopher Lee. Um, It is in Italian with English subtitles and in English. So you have both uh, audio options. In terms of the scan, it doesn't say... 87 minutes, uh, steeped in sadomasochism and lushly photographed in the vivid hues for which the director is known. Mario Bava's The Whip and the Body is a gothic thriller that far surpasses the AIP Edgar Allan Poe films. Well, I don't, let's not get carried away. Those are pretty, some of those are pretty great. Um, that it was intended to emulate horror legend, Christopher Lee, a stars as Kurt Menliff, the sadistic son of a wealthy count who returns to the family castle, much to the dismay of his family, their servants, and the beautiful woman with whom he shares a fondness for the lash. That's Dalla Lavi from The Silencers. Um, when Kurt is found murdered, it brings no peace to those who had feared him, and his vengeful spirit cannot be contained by the grave, and he returns to torment those unfortunate enough to remain within Menliff Manor. The most deliriously romantic horror picture ever made the whip in the body is a decadent masterpiece by the bloody brilliant bava who of course did things like black sunday black sabbath kill baby kill um planet of the vampires i love bava and this is one of his better films and i know my friend elric kane is a big fan i want to say this is one of his favorites uh this does include an audio commentary from uh novelist and critic tim lucas and he is a Bava expert. He um, he wrote the book. I have Mario Bava, Colors of the Dark over here, but it's too heavy for me to even lift up and try and show you uh, a great gift from a, a listener to our podcast. Um, incredible book. And Lucas is the the right guy to do any Bava commentary, and I always love his Bava, Bava commentaries. And I'm pretty sure I've heard this one and, and dug it, so... That is The Whip and the Body. Uh, Again, both original Italian and English tracks. And lastly, we have uh, Anthony Harvey's The Lion in Winter. I love Anthony Harvey because he directed a film I adore called They Might Be Giants, which, yes, the band did, I believe, take their name from, which is a story about George C. Scott as a man who is insane and believes himself to be Sherlock Holmes' And uh, anyway, Anthony Harvey. Um, this is a really great uh, all-star cast. Peter O'Toole, Catherine Hepburn, Anthony Hopkins, Timothy Dalton, Nigel Terry, John Castle, Jane Marrow, and Nigel Stock um, from 1968. Acting greats Peter O'Toole, Catherine Hepburn, Anthony Hopkins, the whole cast I just read. Star in this epic masterpiece directed by Anthony Harvey, They Might Be Giants. Behind the great stone walls of an English castle, the world's most powerful empire is in crisis. Three sons struggle to win their father's favor as well as his crown. King Henry II, that's O'Toole, and his queen, Eleanor, that's Hepburn, engage in a battle of royal wits that pits elder son Richard, uh, that's Anthony Hopkins, against his brothers John, that's Nigel Terry, and Godfrey, John Castle. Uh, While the cunning... King Philip of France, that's Timothy Dalton, takes advantage of the internal fracturing in his bid to destroy their kingdom. Uh, Nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Actor for O'Toole, Director for Harvey, Costume Design, Margaret First, and winner of three Academy Awards, Best Actress for Hepburn, Adapted Screenplay, James Goldman, and Music Score by John Barry. Uh, A really great script, if I recall. Some really great cutting dialogue. Uh, And weirdly... A favorite of Kevin Smith's, which I did not see coming. Or wait, you know what? That's Man for All Seasons. Never mind. Uh, I, I misspoke. Man for All Seasons is the is the Kevin Smith fave. Uh, but this one, I think, is a better movie than Man for All Seasons, if I'm being honest. It's a really 
really interesting uh, and well-written story and great tension, incredible cast. Uh, it's listed as a 4K restoration, uh, but I don't know when. Studio Canal is listed, so I'm sure it looks lovely. Audio commentary by director Anthony Harvey. Uh, that's archival. He's been gone for some time. Interview with sound recordist Simon K as well. Uh, but definitely a movie worth checking out and uh, one that would seem to possibly have influenced things like Game of Thrones and such. I can't be sure, but it feels like it's possible. Uh, but yeah, so that will do it for the Kino uh, reissues and the 4K. Hopefully there's something in there that uh, is interesting to y'all. Thank you so much for listening, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.